The story of Red Rising takes place around 700 years from the present day. By the time Darrow enters the Institute, mankind has expanded across much of the solar system. Nearly every body of rock orbiting our sun, larger than a few dozen kilometers across, has seen a human's touch. However, we have watched the story of the Rising unfold through the eyes of soldiers and politicos, not scientists and explorers, so our view of all but a few of these planetary bodies are fuzzy at best. With that being said, here's all we do know about the solar system in the year 740 PCE, that's post-conquering era. This project got a little out of hand, it was initially going to be a 5 minute synopsis on the planets, but it's grown beyond that. If you want a TLDW though, this exchange between Dancer and Darrow sums it up nicely. Darrow, are they terraformed, the other moons and worlds? Dancer, the small moons, yes, most of the planets, obviously not the gas giants. In the Red Rising universe, we can reasonably expect the sun to be nearly identical to the one we see now. A thousand years is hardly a blink to the sun, so any talk of our star bloating up or beginning its journey to becoming a red giant is wrong. There's also never any mention of a Dyson sphere or a similarly impressive device close to the sun, so we can assume it's largely how it's been for the past few billion years. One note, however, is that it has become the custom of many, namely interior planet golds, to shoot their dead into the sun. According to Lysander, the idea that launching the dearly departed into the sun is a grandiose gesture of honor and beauty is simply a red herring. The real reason this tradition came to being is as a way to categorically ensure nothing is left behind, such as DNA that could later be used for cloning, or as political leverage. Moving outward from the sun, the first rock we come to is Mercury. The first planet seems to have been, at least in terms of sheer unwillingness to permit human life, the hardest body to subdue this side of the asteroid belt. Mercury was tanned by massive planet-shaking machines known as storm gods. This process was not a pleasant one. Darrow goes as far as to call it a traumatic rebirth. The pre-terraforming conditions were so inhospitable it was deemed easier to just restart the planet from the ground up. The so-called messenger planet has also had its surface permanently altered by the orange master maker, Glorastes. Now, I called the planet tame, but I don't think that's how many living on the planet would describe it. The vast majority of Lysander and Darrow's chapters in Dark Age take place on Mercury. So if you recall the harsh desert treks and brutal battles on the sand seen in those characters' POV chapters, you'll have a pretty good idea of a substantial part of Mercury in the Red Rising universe. The desert in which many of these scenes took place is known as the Ladon, Swallower of Armies. These deserts are a byproduct of making the rest of the planet hospitable. Lysander says in Dark Age, Mercury is a lovely planet, with temperate coasts and mountain hotels and hot springs and cool valleys and coral seas. But to have all that, it had to have the hell of the Ladon around its equator. So what beautiful shores and forests could justify the hellish waste of Ladon? Well, Heliopolis and Tyche for two examples, both extremely important cities not only on Mercury but in the solar system as a whole. The little we see of them gives us a glimpse of those temperate coasts and fair, welcoming weather. Virginia mentions the other equalizer of the great waste of Ladon. Jungles so deep and dark you'd think you'd lost the sun and ended up on Pluto, she says, of the dense Mercurian jungles that are home to the pet projects of purple carvers. In addition to the storm god's traumatic rebirth of Mercury, the previously mentioned Glorastes, an orange architect who has managed to curry favor even with the most uppity golds, has also left his mark on the planet. At the behest of the planet's gold rulers, Glorastes has made Mercury and namely Heliopolis true testaments to mankind's control over nature. He has turned entire mountain ranges into wonders and turned Heliopolis into a jewel of gold society. Lysander mentions some of his more notable works in Dark Age. He built the Water Gardens, the Library of Erebos, the Water Colossus, the Ocular Sphere. He's a god here, as oranges go. We also know that Mercury is a highly industrialized planet and a major supplier of the solar system's raw metal needs. Mercury is the only inner planet to not have an institute. Although as we move through the solar system, I will not be commenting on the nature of every planetary body's inhabitants, I believe the Mercurian natives are worth a closer look. By many accounts, the people, and that includes all colors, are just odd on Mercury. On no other planet, not even the rim, would the cast color orange in the title God even be mentioned in the same sentence. 
Also, as noted multiple times by both Darrow and Lysander, and as is evident in Glorastes and his workers' willingness to help Lysander with his betrayal to the Rising, the low colors of Mercury seem rather content with their station in life. They despise Darrow and the Rising, and large portions of the population actively work against them. They refer to the Republic's free legions as Martian marauders. To outsiders, they seem content with their chains. Now this could be due to a number of things. Either the Gold Masters are more docile on Mercury, instilling confidence and a degree of respect, bits of which can be seen in the Rim, or maybe they are so unbearably cruel that the Mercurians simply see no hope of overturning Gold Rule, so see no reason to join Darrow. Or, as Thraxus says, maybe simply those born on the smallest planet simply have the smallest appetite for war. Mercury has no natural moons, and there is no evidence of a substantial artificial satellite orbiting the planet. We know considerably less about Venus than we do Mercury. We do know, however, that it was one of the last planets to become home to humanity. Venus as we know it in 2020 is host to cruel temperatures and acid rain, but in the Red Rising universe it's quite the opposite. Mankind has somehow transferred unfathomable amounts of hydrogen from the gas giants to Venus and used catapulted asteroids to kickstart its rotation. Now Venus is home to beautiful seas and sprawling archipelagos. From what we've seen and heard in the books, the entire planet can be described this way. No swallower of armies like on Mercury or so-called dark continents on Earth. Just tame seas and lovely islands. We also know Venus is an industrialized planet home to a majority of the inner solar system shipbuilding capacity, and further home to some of the solar system's most advanced shipbuilding capabilities, second only to the outer rim. Venus is also unique in that it is largely self-sustaining. It is able to provide and feed armies as well as produce and man ships. I know I said I wouldn't do it, but I think it's again worth mentioning the inhabitants of this particular rock. Venusian golds seem to represent the worst, or best depending on your perspective of golds. Brutal killers who truly believe they are a different species than those lower in the color caste system. Surrounded by greed, gluttony, and decadence, even among the Lunese, Venetians are considered selfish, brutal, and deft liars. Of significant renown is the political school on Venus, where golds who aspire to hold high office go to learn the art of deception and politics. Of just as significant renown, but in a much different way, is the Institute of Venus. Just as the Martian Institute, we know from a younger Darrow's perspective, is known for death and battles and violence, its Venusian counterpart is known for rape and betrayal. Like Mercury, Venus also lacks any substantial satellites. With some exceptions, Earth seems to be largely the same as someone on the International Space Station would see it today. Anyone who's made it past the first few chapters of Red Rising knows that the birthplace of humanity is no longer the center of attention. In fact, the first scene on Earth does not take place until the last chapter of the first trilogy. Earth lost its solar supremacy in what is known as the Conquering, roughly 740 years before Darrow enters the Institute. The Conquering, of course, being the humankind-scale civil war between the now color-coded Lunese and the Earthlings. Before the Conquering, however, was World War III. The Third World War saw extensive use of nuclear weapons to the point that entire continents became inhospitable. The radioactive land is now known as Dark Continents, and even more than 700 years later they still seem to be, at the very least, on the scale of the Chernobyl Closed Zone. It's never said exactly which of Earth's land masses are now these Dark Continents, and we see so little of our home world it's difficult to even hazard a guess. However, we do see mention of various island nations and vague descriptions of continents still inhabited and seemingly healthy during the Rising. These include New Zealand, Jamaica, Japan, at least some of the Pacific Islands, North Africa, and parts of the Americas. What we see of these still habitable parts of Earth is at least recognizable to someone today. For instance, when Darrow visits Earth for the first time, he describes seagulls, evergreens, eagles, and calm waves. We also know that Earth is home to two institutes, hinting at a still very sizable population. The Earth is also one of the main core system homes of obsidians, with Earth's poles being used as obsidian breeding grounds similar to Mars. Earth doesn't have a monopoly on arable land as Io does in the Rim, but still, instead of mining for helium-3, reds on Earth toil on farms. It seems to be mostly an agricultural planet still. 
at the very least responsible for feeding the city moon of Luna. Earth, of course, has one natural satellite. In addition to the moon, orbiting a million kilometers from the Earth's core, are the Rubicon beacons. These small beacons act as no trespassing signs, as well as being sensors and transponders protecting the innermost domain of the Sovereign. Earth's moon is the only body besides Earth humans have stepped foot on at the time of writing this. Its close proximity makes it a natural choice for expanded solar enterprises. This was the choice they made in Red Rising as well. Luna was the first body to see large-scale human activity. Because of this head start, Luna is far and away the most industrialized and urban body in the solar system, surpassing even Earth herself. The majority of the moon is one cohesive city. Deborah refers to it as the city moon of Earth. Think a New York Tokyo that covers nearly the entire face of the moon. If you are a Star Wars fan, think Coruscant. Now take this city moon you're imagining and stretch the buildings out 7 miles from the surface, 14 times taller than the Burj Khalifa, currently the tallest building on Earth. Part of how they are able to build this high is the reduced gravity. There is no evidence it has been modified in any way, meaning the gravity on Luna is 1 6th Earth standard. It is such a drastic change that rain falls noticeably slower on Luna than Earth or Mars. Hyperion. City of Light, the capital of Luna, the Society, and now the Republic, is known as the Jewel of the Empire. Hyperion is the epitome of Luna, truly a city that never sleeps. Something is always happening. You can only afford to see what you want to see. Here, I think the word cyberpunk evokes a more accurate image than New York or Tokyo. Snaking public trams and air thoroughfares, flashing communication centers, bustling restaurants, and austere police stations weave into the metal dermis of the city like blood capillaries, nerve endings, sweat glands, and hair follicles. But like any good cyberpunk city, below the high-rises and rooftop parks, there are the slums. Hyperion is scarily representative of the color pyramid as a whole. Darrow says it best. We fall away from gold districts, forsaking the high reaches of the city where stately shuttles and grav boots ferry golds to opera houses atop kilometers high towers. We dive down past the wealthy silver and copper districts, winding our way through rung paths and aerial trains through the mid districts where the yellows, greens, blues, and violets reside, past the low district where the grays and oranges make their homes. Down and down we go to the gutters of the city where the roots of this colossal steel jungle burrow into the ground. Myriad low colors ride public transportation from factories to their windowless apartments, some no longer than a meter by three. Only room enough for a bed. Cars rattle out exhaust and clogged beacon-lit boulevards. The deeper we go, the fewer the lights. The dirtier the buildings, the stranger the animals, but the more brilliant the graffiti. This dark and dreary Gotham-esque slumville is known as the Lost City. Lost City is in every sense of the word, the slums. Full of homeless, drug addicts, and vagrants, stunted buildings crammed between the foundations of the skyscrapers above. But as Lost City is analogous to the lower colors in the society, Hyperion above is just as representative of the golds. Shuttles, grav boots, and opera houses certainly paint the picture of gold, but beyond that, Hyperion is where the society started, and so, Luna is also the best representative of gold. Lysander contrasts Luna with the rim golds. Namely, he points out that the gold culture of lies and deceit and politics that is Luna. If Luna is a giant New York, the Citadel is Central Park. The namesake of this respite from skyscrapers and slums is an ancient fortress dating all the way back to the Conquering. Impenetrable and infinitely complex, the Citadel is the Red Rising equivalent of the White House, Pentagon, Capitol Building, Camp David, and National Mall all put into the middle of a state park. It's hard to estimate with great accuracy, but to say its grounds cover dozens of square miles seems accurate. The fortress itself acts as the main node of intelligence and military command, as well as the occasional quarters for the Sovereign. The grounds are home to palatial gardens and immense villas, each with acres of grounds used to room visiting houses. The Citadel grounds also house the Forum of the Senate, into which leads the Lunis Via Triumphia, a 12-kilometer long avenue used for parades and victory marches. Towering above the Citadel grounds is the Palace of Light, also known as the Citadel of Light, 
created by our friend the Master Maker Glorastes, from which the solar system is ruled. As Central Park has its reservoir, the Citadel Grounds has the Sea of Serenity. It seems to sit between the Citadel and Hyperion, and is at least big enough to accommodate beaches of seashells. There is much more to be said of the Citadel and its grounds, but it would take up the remainder of this video, so we'll move on. Although many excerpts paint Luna as a mini Coruscant, one giant planetary city that is, that doesn't seem to be entirely accurate. Darrow notes, the northern hemisphere of the moon, comprised of mountains and seas, is less populous than the belt of cities that girdle the equator. So it seems the megacity of the equator eventually gives way to more of an upstate landscape towards the poles. Luna is also home to its very own institute, although we know very little about it. A combination of Luna's immense industrialization combined with its limited real estate give it the busiest orbit. Luna's orbit is home to massive astro docks used for inspection, security, and traffic control. Mars started its terraforming process about 500 years before the events of the first Red Rising. That puts it about 200 years after the conquering of Earth. 200 years after that is when cities started to pop up, protected by atmosphere bubbles. This makes Mars the first planet besides Earth to support permanent human life. Save for the fact that gravity on Mars is one-third that, on Earth, people would be pretty hard-pressed to tell what planet they're standing on. Most of the Mars in Red Rising is blue and green from space like Earth is today. People are free to roam the surface of the planet without fear of solar burns or sub-zero nights. Great lakes teem with exotic carved marine life. There are forests and fjords and there are highlands and jungles. There are a thousand cities on Mars, most of which covered by shields, though not to protect from the sandstorms and radiation as the early ones did, but to protect from invasion and off-world usurpers. The cities on Mars are grand and elegant, not as gloomy and cyberpunk as on Luna or as crowded and old as on Earth. Martian cities are wide and generally inspired by the Greek and Roman culture the Golds idolized so much. Still though, a lot of Mars' surface is barren and devoid of any vegetation, described usually as great plains with roaming dust devils. The poles of Mars are much like Earth's, icy and cold. It is here, along with the poles of some other planets, where the society keeps its obsidian population after their own uprising, known as the Dark Revolt. By the time Darrow graduates from the Institute, Mars is probably the most powerful single planetary entity in the solar system. It has a population of billions and more farmable land than Earth ever had. It also has the factories and industry needed to arm these potential soldiers. The pole-dwelling bread-for-war Martian obsidians mentioned before are one of Mars's biggest exports and are a substantial force in and of themselves. Mars is also the main source of helium-3 for the solar system, H3 being the main fuel source for ships and terraforming. Mars, of course, has its own institute. In fact, there's an entire book written about it. The Martian Institute, along with the capital Aegea, are located inside the Valles Marineris, a system of canyons on the surface of Mars. There's no mention of significant astrodocs or other artificial satellites around Mars, however the planet does have two natural moons, the brothers Phobos and Deimos. The vampire moon is the literal embodiment of the term city moon. It's also the first place we've been to on this tour with no breathable atmosphere or substantial gravity. If you wish to leave the confines of towers, best have an oxygen supply and some grav boots, or be tethered to something big. With a mean radius of only 11 kilometers, there is no room on Phobos for lakes or parks, just raw economics. The entire moon is a pincushion of towers and docks. Darrow says 600 years worth of buildings are stacked on Phobos, meaning that this moon was one of the first solar bodies to see human activity. Phobos means fear. Darrow says it's a fitting name, and from what we've seen, I would have to agree with him. Phobos is like an astronomical oil rig. No one really lives there. The only people with any sort of comfort are those at the top of the food chain. Everyone else works 14 hours a day and sleeps in 30 square foot rooms. The moon has been carved hollow and filled up again, only with an assembly of cages instead of rock. These caged three-walled residences are collectively known as the Stack Cities of Phobos. 
The tour Darrow gets in Morningstar reminds me of pictures of the walled city of Kowloon in China. As I said, no one really lives on Phobos, at least not on purpose. It is sold to workers as an oil rig or fishing expedition or drilling work as sold here on Earth in 2020. Go for a few months, maybe years, work hard and diligently in a sun industries factory, make all the money you could ever dream of and return to your family, a well-off person set for life. Of course, things rarely work out for the lower colors as gold promises. Raw economics leaves no room for migratory workers or families. People get stuck on Phobos as people were stuck in company towns in Industrial Revolution Europe or the American West. Those being towns where one company or corporation owns everything and is also the main employer. Which of course leads to cycles of debt and blood-sucking tactics of infinite servitude. The Hive City is filled with thousands if not tens of thousands of people this so-called contract labor has spit out, broken, destroyed, and most likely addicted to something. Of course though, not all inhabitants of the Vampire Moon live in absolute poverty. At the top of those pin cushions, just as the top of the pyramid, there lives the gold. Although Phobos may be considered progressive, in that on this moon of pure economics there exists the chance for silvers and coppers to rise to a power closer to golds than anywhere else in the solar system, such as happened with Regulus Ag Sun, better known as Quicksilver, ringed around the city moon sure to help compensate for the small size of Phobos are two gigantic astro docks used as cargo harbors for exporting Phobos's manufactured goods. The smaller of the two Martian moons has half the radius of his bigger brother and about a third the surface area. We don't know much about this little moon, in fact all we know is that it's called the Battle Moon. It is occasionally referenced as a minor point of operation for military campaigns, and Rokal Fabii had such a spectacular siege of the moon that it became his moniker. We also know that Deimos himself was the Greek god of terror, and that Pierce Brown and Golds alike loved mixing their symbolism and deities. From this, I would assume Deimos simply acts as a moon-sized aircraft carrier. Probably heavily defended and able to handle the refueling and resupplying of solar fleets, at least for some time, with a sizable contingent of soldiers. I hope to complete this tour of the solar system in the near future, so stay tuned for the next installment where we'll take a look at the gas giants, dwarf planets, and asteroids. If you'd like to see more of this type of content, let us know, and if there are specific red rising topics you'd like to see explored, please share those ideas with us. Thanks for watching.